Hey, have you heard any good books lately? This is Talking Audiobooks, your weekly podcast for all news, discussion, and opinions surrounding the wonderful world of audiobooks. And now, the Talking Audiobooks podcast presents Audiobooks for the 4th of July. Hello, everyone. This is Casey Trowbridge, and I am the host of the Talking Audiobooks podcast. You'll notice that I did not start this episode with my usual greeting, and that is because this is a special bonus episode, so we are going to do things a little bit differently. This is going to be a companion to the weekly episodic podcast that you hear every Friday. This is what we are calling a theme episode. This is our first theme episode, and we plan to do this from time to time, where we pick a particular theme and then play audiobook excerpts that are connected to that theme. Some of these themes will be uh, serious, as in today's topic. Some of them will be quite lighthearted. Others will be timed to specific times of the year and specific things that take place. And what we are going to do in the future is we are going to announce these theme episodes on the main episodes of the Talking Audiobooks podcast. And we're going to ask you for your recommendations. We're going to ask you to contribute suggestions for what we should feature in these themed episodes. And if we use the book that you recommend to us in our theme episode, we are going to send you a promo code for a free audiobook from audible.com. And yes, that's a free book. You can get whatever book your heart desires. And that's all just for contributing a suggestion to our themed episodes. So be on the lookout or keep your ears open, if you will, for uh, future announcements of theme shows so that you can help contribute selections to them and get a free audiobook in the process. This week, we're going to discuss the fourth of July, as the 4th of July is a big American holiday. I know that's not breaking news even to people outside of the United States, but the 4th of July is the celebration of America's birthday, uh, American independence, and we are going to look at some audiobooks that center around that time frame. Most of the books that we are going to feature today are historical nonfiction in nature, but we do have a fiction title in there as well for you to enjoy. Um, There's not going to be a lot of me talking on the show other than the introduction here and the conclusions. You're going to hear me introduce book excerpts, and then they're going to play, and that's all that this episode is going to be. It's meant to expose you to some titles that you might find interesting or you didn't know about and would now like to add to your wish list. Or maybe there are things that you've read and you've enjoyed and would like to reread or re-listen to in audiobook format. And so that is kind of the idea of our show today. Of course, the 4th of July is a time when Americans... Uh, like to cook out and barbecue and uh, go to uh, fireworks displays and light off fireworks of their own. It annoys dogs. Uh, Sometimes dogs do not like the sound of fireworks. Uh, I do not advise that you try to listen to an audiobook as you're setting off fireworks because the noise of the latter may obscure or hinder your ability to hear the former, but if you are looking for a good uh, 4th of July related audiobook, a tie in that you can listen to, uh, this podcast is going to help you find those books. So now that I've rambled on for a few minutes and broken my promise to make this an episode where you don't hear me speak a lot. Let's move to our first selection in audiobooks for the 4th of July. (music) 
1776 is thought of as the iconic year in American history. It is the year of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, after all. But in our first selection, our author makes the case that we should look at the year 1775 as the catalyst for when it all began, when the movement for America's independence really took off. Our author is iconoclastic historian and political chronicler Kevin Phillips. The production company behind this audiobook is Brilliance Audio. It is narrated by Arthur Morey. The book was released on November 27th, 2012. And settle in because this one is a long listen. It has a running time of 25 hours and 44 minutes. The title of our book is is 1775 a good year for revolution and as i said the author makes his case that we should focus more of our attention on the events that took place in the year 1775 and so here is an excerpt from 1775 a good year for revolution by kevin phillips as our first selection in audiobooks for the fourth of july Through much of the 19th century and up until the 1960s and 1970s, in some cases even more recently, scholars from the mainstream of Southern Baptist religion and culture, at universities like Furman and Mercer, and at institutions like the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and the North and South Carolina Baptist Historical Societies, dealt reasonably candidly with the extreme behavior of early separate Baptist preachers and congregations in the Carolinas. These extremes dated back to the 1760s and 1770s before the separates were drawn into more acceptable conduct by the Baptist church mergers in southern states and related cultural transformations of the late 1780s and 1790s. Southern Baptists are now, by far and away, the largest religious denomination in the Carolinas, and publications in recent decades have minimized the separates' initial religious and political behavior. Baptists are hardly unique. Other Protestant denominations have also tidied up with respect to the decade of the Revolution. The newly active Methodists, whom we will revisit in the Chesapeake region, were not a major presence in the northern or southern back country. Their seeming Toryism in eastern Maryland, pro-British missionaries and occasional interference with Patriot militia recruitment, was less of a problem in Virginia. Separate Baptist activity in the South first unfolded in the North Carolina Piedmont after the arrival in 1755 of New England missionary Shubal Stearns. He and his brother-in-law, Daniel Marshall, established a church at Sandy Creek, east of what is now Greensboro. In just 17 years, a network of 42 new churches and 125 ministers developed from that small beginning, making the Sandy Creek Church the mother of all separate Baptists. Separate Baptists, whose beliefs also reflected and bred dislike of civic authority, helped to nurture the North Carolina regulator movement. This came about through the overlapping Sandy Creek Association, founded in 1766 to confront local corruption and encourage rural political activism. Although not a member, Stearns kept in close touch. Following the Regulators' defeat at the Battle of Alamance, fought just a few miles away in 1771, troops under the order of Governor Tryon devastated this section of the Piedmont. The membership of the Sandy Creek Separate Baptist Church plummeted to 14 from 600 as residents fled. Tryon, who led the reprisals, charged that the majority of rebellious farmers were Baptists and Quakers. This was probably true, but the interaction of Baptist New Lights and Quaker Inner Lights in the North Carolina backcountry told only part of the tale. The Pennsylvania-fed population of the Piedmont also included two other faiths with mystical and pacifist overtones, Dunkards, Moravians, and loosely affiliated sympathizers of German background. The regulator movement also bore some of their imprint, according to one of its closest researchers. No group so unusual or so unmilitarily minded was likely to reassemble to fight under loyalist auspices. 
A hundred odd miles to the southwest, many of the same population groups, Pennsylvanian and North Carolinian, Scotch-Irish, German and English, Presbyterian and Baptist, had also been pouring into the South Carolina backcountry. Churches were few and denominational lines were melting. Larger numbers of Scotch-Irish were disaffecting, and here again the influence of Schubel Stearns was at work, albeit through preacher Philip Mulkey, whose preachings went far beyond those of his early mentor. Justice Stearns seated a large group of separate Baptist associations in Piedmont, North Carolina. Mulkey did so in South Carolina, beginning in 1759 or 1760. Older histories of South Carolina Baptists identify his Fair Forest Church as the first in a network of separate associations that rapidly spread through that province's backcountry. Their locations, collected and marked in one old map, can be shorthanded as the area lying between the Broad and Saluda rivers. It is no coincidence that Revolutionary War buffs use this same shorthand to describe the regional stronghold of Loyalists and would-be neutrals during the South Carolina Civil War of 1775. Distaste for Mulkey was one of the few criticisms voiced by Anglican Woodmason and also by Richard Furman and Oliver Hart the two leading but non-separate Baptists on the Patriot side in 1775 and 1776. If our last author was able to convince you of the importance of 1775, our next title does look at the year that followed, 1776, the year of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, this title comes to you from Simon and Schuster Audio. This is a book that runs 11 hours and 32 minutes. It was released on audio, or on audible.com at least, on May 20th, 2005. It is written and narrated by the author David McCullough, and this is 1776 in this book is a look at some of the key players involved and some of the smaller players involved in the American Revolution. Uh, it focuses on the commanders of the American and British armies and some of the soldiers that took up the cause in the American Revolution. Here is an excerpt from David McCullough's 1776 on audiobooks for the 4th of July. Over the heavy spoked wheels, front and back, loomed four gilded sea gods, formidable reminders that Britannia ruled the waves. Allegorical scenes on the door panels celebrated the nation's heritage, and windows were of sufficient size to provide a full view of the crowned sovereign within. It was as though the very grandeur, wealth, and weight of the British Empire were rolling past, an empire that by now included Canada that reached from the seaboard of Massachusetts and Virginia to the Mississippi and beyond, from the Caribbean to the shores of Bengal. London, its population at nearly a million souls, was the largest city in Europe and widely considered the capital of the world. George III had been 22 when in 1760 he succeeded to the throne, and to a remarkable degree he remained a man of simple tastes and few pretensions. He liked plain food and drank but little, and wine only. Defying fashion, he refused to wear a wig. That the palace of St. James's had become a bit dowdy bothered him not at all. He rather liked it that way. Socially awkward at court occasions, many found him disappointingly dull, he preferred puttering about his farms at Windsor dressed in farmer's clothes. And in notable contrast to much of fashionable society and the court, where mistresses and infidelities were not only an accepted part of life, but often flaunted, the king remained steadfastly faithful to his very plain queen, the German princess Charlotte Sophia of mecklenburg strelitz with whom, by now, he had produced ten children. Ultimately, there would be fifteen. Gossips claim Farmer George's chief pleasures were a leg of mutton and his plain little wife. But this was hardly fair. 
nor was he the unattractive, dim-witted man critics claimed then and afterward. Tall and rather handsome, with clear blue eyes and a generally cheerful expression, George III had a genuine love of music and played both the violin and piano. His favorite composer was Handel, but he adored also the music of Bach, and in 1764 had taken tremendous delight in hearing the boy Mozart perform on the organ. He loved architecture and did quite beautiful architectural drawings of his own. With a good eye for art, he had begun early to assemble his own collection, which by now included works by the contemporary Italian painter Canaletto, as well as watercolors and drawings by such old masters as Poussin and Raphael. He avidly collected books to the point where he had assembled one of the finest libraries in the world. He adored clocks, ship models, took great interest in things practical, took great interest in astronomy, and founded the Royal Academy of Arts. He also had a gift for putting people at their ease. Samuel Johnson, the era's reigning arbiter of all things of the mind, and no easy judge of men, responded warmly to the unaffected good nature of George III. They had met and conversed for the first time when Johnson visited the King's Library, after which Johnson remarked to the librarian, Sir, they may talk of the King as they will, but he is the finest gentleman I have ever seen. Stories that he'd been slow to learn that by age eleven he still could not read were unfounded. The strange behavior, the so-called madness of King George III, for which he would be long remembered, did not come until much later, more than twenty years later, and rather than mental illness, it appears to have been porphyria, a hereditary disease not diagnosed until the twentieth century. Still youthful at thirty-seven and still hard-working after fifteen years on the throne, he could be notably willful and often short-sighted. But he was sincerely patriotic and everlastingly duty-bound. George, be a king, his mother had told him. As the crisis in America grew worse and the opposition in Parliament more strident, he saw clearly that he must play the part of the patriot king. He had never been a soldier, he had never been to America, any more than he had set foot in Scotland or Ireland, but with absolute certainty he knew what must be done. He would trust to Providence and his high sense of duty. America must be made to obey. I have no doubt but the nation at large sees the conduct in America in its true light, he had written to his Prime Minister, Lord North and I am certain any other conduct but compelling obedience would be ruinous, and, therefore, no consideration could bring me to swerve from the present path, which I think myself in duty bound to follow. In the House of Lords in March of 1775, when challenged on the chances of Britain ever winning a war in America, Lord Sandwich, first Lord of the Admiralty, had looked incredulous. Suppose the colonies do abound in men. What does that signify, he asked. They are raw, undisciplined, cowardly men. And Lord Sandwich was by no means alone in that opinion. General James Grant, a member of the House of Commons, had boasted that with 5,000 British regulars he could march from one end of the American continent to the other, a claim that was widely quoted. But in striking contrast, several of the most powerful speakers in Parliament, like the flamboyant Lord Mayor of London John Wilkes, and the leading Whig intellectual Edmund Burke, had voiced ardent support and admiration for the Americans. On March 22nd in the House of Commons, Burke had delivered in his heavy Irish brogue one of the longest, most brilliant speeches of his career, calling for conciliation with America. Yet for all that, no one in either House, Tory or Whig, denied the supremacy of Parliament in determining what was best for America. Even Edmund Burke, in his celebrated speech, had referred repeatedly to our colonies. Convinced that his army at Boston was insufficient, the king had dispatched reinforcements and three of his best major generals, William Howe, John Burgoyne, and Henry Clinton. Howe, a member of Parliament and a Whig, had earlier told his Nottingham constituents that if it came to a war in America and he were offered a command, he would decline. But now duty called. I was ordered, and I could not refuse, without incurring the odious name of backwardness, to serve my country in distress, he explained. Howe, who had served in America during the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War, as it was known in America, 
was convinced the insurgents were few in number in comparison to those loyal to the crown. War had come on April 19th, with the first blood shed at Lexington and Concord near Boston, then savagely on June 17th at Breed's Hill and Bunker Hill. The June engagement was commonly known as the Battle of Bunker Hill on both sides of the Atlantic. British troops remained under siege at Boston and were running short of food and supplies. On July 3rd, General George Washington of Virginia had taken command of the American rebel. With 3,000 miles of ocean separating Britain from her American colonies, accounts of such events took a month or more to reach London. By the time the first news of Lexington and Concord arrived, it was the end of May, and Parliament had begun its long summer holiday, its members departing London for their country estates. When the outcome of Bunker Hill became known in the last week of July, it only hardened the King's resolve. We must persist, he told Lord North. I know I am doing my duty, and therefore can never wish to retract. The ever-obliging North suggested that in view of the situation in America, it might no longer be regarded as a rebellion, but as a foreign war, and thus every expedient might be employed. At a hurried meeting at 10 Downing Street on July 26th, the Cabinet decided to send 2,000 reinforcements to Boston without delay and to have an army of no fewer than 20,000 regulars in America by the following spring. Bunker Hill was proclaimed a British victory, which technically it was. But in plain truth, His Majesty's forces, led by General Howe, had suffered more than a thousand casualties in an appalling slaughter before gaining the high ground. As was observed acidly in both London and Boston, a few more such victories would surely spell ruin for the victors. At summer's end, a British ship out of Boston docked at Plymouth bearing 170 sick and wounded officers and soldiers, most of whom had fought at Bunker Hill, and all in great distress, as described in a vivid published account. A few of the men came on shore when never hardly were seen such objects, some without legs and others without arms, and their clothes hanging on them like a loose morning gown so much were they fallen away by sickness and want of nourishment. There were, moreover, near sixty women and children on board, the widows and children of men who were slain. Some of these, too, exhibited a most shocking spectacle. And even the vessel itself, though very large, was almost intolerable from the stench arising from the sick and wounded. Fifty-six men signed the Declaration of Independence, but how well do you know them? How well do you know what happened to them after they signed the Declaration? Some of them went on to prosper. Others were not so fortunate. Our next title takes a look at the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence and the fates that befell them afterwards. The title is called Signing Their Lives Away, the Fame and Misfortune of the Men Who Signed the Declaration of Independence. This is written by Denise Kiernan and Joseph de Agnes. It is read by Susan Larkin. This is a production of Audible Studios. The audiobook was released on September 25th, 2013. It has a running time of 7 hours and 51 minutes. And here now is an excerpt from Signing Their Lives Away, the fame and misfortune of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence. Happy Fourth of July. Wait, scratch that. We mean happy 2nd of July. Hold on, that's still not right. Happy 2nd of August. John Adams thought that future generations of Americans should celebrate Independence Day with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward forever more. Adams omitted the burgers 
hot dogs and beer kegs, but his heart was in the right place. Oddly, when he wrote these words to his wife Abigail on July 3rd, 1776, he wasn't talking about the 4th of July. He was speaking of what he considered to be the nation's true birthday, July 2nd, 1776. The events leading up to that date were as follows. On June 7th, 1776, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia proposed that the colonies break with England. Though the citizenry had debated this point for years, the thought of finally doing the deed shook the delegates. To calm themselves, they did what any political body would do. They postponed the vote for a month. During that time, a committee of five congressmen, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Robert R. Livingston, and Roger Sherman, was appointed to write the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson ended up doing most of the heavy lifting, with some editorial suggestions from Adams and Franklin. Tensions were running high by July 1st, the day of an unofficial vote. Only nine colonies supported the break. South Carolina and Pennsylvania voted no. Delaware was deadlocked, and New York abstained. But when the official vote came on July 2nd, 12 of the 13 colonies voted in favor. New York abstained again. They were waiting for permission that was held up in ye old traffic, but promised they would likely vote yea in a few days. It wasn't exactly unanimous, but Congress went with it anyway. The motion carried. A new nation was born. For the next two days, Congress polished the language of the Declaration, and the document was officially adopted on July 4th. But only two men, President of Congress John Hancock and his secretary, Charles Thompson, actually signed the document on that day. Shortly after, a local printer named John Dunlap set the words into type and about 200 copies were distributed throughout the new 13 states. When Americans saw the July 4th date emblazoned at the top of Dunlap's broadside, they mistook the date of adoption for the date of the momentous vote. In fact, it wasn't until August 2nd, 1776, that the majority of the signers affixed their signatures to a fancier version of the unanimous declaration, the one displayed today at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. By August 1776, thousands of colonists were already regarding July 4th as the most important date in their fledgling nation's history. To avoid upsetting this pleasant fiction... Congress sneakily backdated some official records to show that all 56 men had signed on July 4, 1776. Of course, this introduced a bizarre anachronism into the final record. The men who were present in Philadelphia and who voted for independence on July 2nd were not the same group of men who signed on August 2nd. By the time August 2nd rolled around, some of the original voters were out of town, fighting in the war, helping their states write new constitutions, or they had been replaced by entirely new delegates. Moreover, not all the delegates could make it to the big affair on August 2nd, and so they signed when they could get around to it, one as late as 1781. John Adams once said that bringing the fractious colonies together was like getting 13 clocks to strike at once. In our next selection, historian John Fairling takes a look at what exactly it took to get us to the point that the Declaration of Independence could be signed in the first place. Uh, John Fairling is an American historian who specializes in the revolutionary time period, and as a result has several books that we could have included on this themed episode. 
but I have picked Independence, The Struggle to Set America Free. This is a production of Tantor Audio. It was released on June 21st, 2011. It has an approximate running time of 16 hours and 25 minutes, and it is narrated by Robert Fass. And now here on audiobooks for the 4th of July is an excerpt from John Fairling's Independence, The Struggle to Set America Free. This book is about the struggle in America over how best to resist British actions and secure American interests and to secure the prevailing interest of individual colonies. It is also about the battles in London over how best to deal with and respond to the recalcitrant American colonists. It is a story filled with irony, for in the end the Americans opted for an independence that most of them had wished to avert, while Britain's leaders were confronted with a declaration of American independence that they had sought to prevent, first by peaceful means, later through strident measures. The choices that were made on both sides were made by individuals, and this book evaluates the key players, important members of the Continental Congress, as well as British ministers and their principal adversaries in Parliament. Public officials in that day were not unlike today's officials. Some who held positions of authority were high-minded and sought what they thought was best for the nation. Some were visionaries. Some were inspired by deeply held philosophical convictions. Some were vengeful. Some acted on behalf of narrow provincial interests or sought to protect the entrenched elite. Some were motivated by the hope of enhancing their careers or reputations. Some sought economic gain. Many were driven by a combination of these motives, and no one had a crystal ball. No one could say unequivocally what the long-term results would be if the choice he advocated was adopted. On the American side the members of Congress remained deeply divided over the best course to pursue all the way down to July 1776. Some congressmen desperately sought to avoid war and revolution. Some held intransigently to the hope of reconciliation. Some reluctantly accepted independence. And some surreptitiously yearned for independence years before it was declared. This is the story of able and ambitious politicians, including America's founders, scrambling to land on their feet, of members of Congress walking a political tightrope between the conflicting interests of New England, the Mid-Atlantic colonies, and the South, of men who were daring and men who were timid, of men who were tied to the past and men who dreamed of what might be a glorious future. Britain's ministers and those in Parliament who opposed them simultaneously groped for the means of saving Great Britain's North American empire. It is a spellbinding tale of a great modern nation blundering into a disaster as its leaders become trapped by their earliest decisions, making them captives in a descent toward tragedy. How the hard and unbending British leaders steered their nation toward an epic disaster provides lessons for politicians in any time period. Britain's rulers coped with the welter of interests in a great modern state. At the same time, they sought to avoid the appearance of weakness. Their story, it seems now, is that of short-sighted leaders on a straightforward path to catastrophe. Above all, this is a story that could have ended differently. A declaration of American independence, at least in 1776, might never have occurred. There were ways that the imperial crisis might have been resolved, and this book tells the story of the options and alternatives that existed. But mostly, it is a human story. Some forty years after 1776, Thomas Jefferson tried to set the record straight. He was troubled that subsequent generations had come to credit the Founding Fathers with a wisdom more than human, and to view their achievements with sanctimonious reverence. With regard to independence, Jefferson knew that the story of what had transpired between the Boston Tea Party in 1773 and the Declaration of Independence in 1776 was far more complex. He knew that the struggle to break America's colonial shackles had been a very human story, filled with shards of weakness, opportunism, accidents, deceit, fortuity, enmity, decisions wise and misguided, exemplary leadership, and ultimately heroic boldness. John Adams would have agreed with Jefferson. 
He too knew how difficult the struggle had been to bring Congress to declare independence, and not long after the battle had been won, he declared, Posterity, you will never know how much it cost the revolutionary generation to preserve your freedom. The leaders on both sides were ordinary mortals who happened to be confronted with extraordinary challenges. This is the story of their response to the uncommon challenges they faced. Historical nonfiction has been the theme of our show up to this point, but I did promise you a fiction title. And this is a book that I read when I was in junior high in my eighth grade history class. In fact, I believe we listened to it as a class on cassette. So there's another audiobook experience from much earlier in my life. This book was written many, many years ago by Esther Forbes. It is the story of a young silversmith's apprentice who, after being crippled in an accident, is left without an occupation and ends up becoming a messenger for the Sons of Liberty during the events that lead up to the Boston Tea Party and the skirmishes at Lexington and Concord. This is Johnny Tremaine. It is written by Esther Forbes, narrated by George Goodell. This is a production of Recorded Books. It was released on Audible.com on July 17th, 2013, though this recording has a copyright date of 1994. And here is an excerpt from this 9 hour and 25 minute recording of Johnny Tremaine by Esther Forbes on audiobooks for the 4th of July. lugger beds up. Get them down here. You pull that worthless dove right out of bed. You give Dusty a kick for me. I'm waiting for him to fetch fresh water so as I can get on with breakfast. Johnny Tremaine was on his feet. He didn't bother to answer his mistress. He turned to the fat, pale, almost white-haired boy still wallowing in bed. Hear that, dove? Oh, you leave me lay, can't you? Grumbling, he swung his legs out of the bed the three boys shared. Johnny was already in his leather breeches, pulling on his coarse shirt, tucking in the tails. He was a rather skinny boy, neither large nor small for fourteen. He had a thin, sleep-flushed face, light eyes, a wry mouth, and fair, lank hair. Although two years younger than the swinish dove, inches shorter, pounds lighter, he knew, and old Mr. Lapham knew, Busy Mrs. Lapham and her four daughters, and Dove and Dusty also knew that Johnny Tremaine was boss of the attic and almost of the house. Dusty Miller was eleven. It was easy for Johnny to say, Look sharp, Dusty, and little Dusty looked sharp. But Dove, his first name had long ago been forgotten, hated the way the younger apprentice lorded it over him, telling him when to go to bed, when to get up, criticizing his work in the silversmith's shop as though he were already a master smith. Hadn't he been working four years for Mr. Lapham and Johnny only two? Why did the boy have to be so infernally smart with his hands and his tongue? Look here, Johnny, I'm not getting up because you tell me to. I'm getting up because Mrs. Lapham tells me to. All right, said Johnny blandly, just so you're up. There was only one window in the attic. Johnny always stood before it as he dressed. He liked this view down the length of Hancock's wharf. Counting houses, shops, stores, sail lofts, and one great ship after another, home again after their voyaging, content as cows waiting to be milked. He watched the gulls, so fierce and beautiful, fighting and screaming among the ships. Beyond the wharf was the sea, and the rocky islands where gulls nested. He knew to the fraction of a moment how long it would take the two other boys to get into their clothes. Swinging about, he leaped for the head of the ladder, hardly looking where he went. One of Dove's big feet got there first. Johnny stumbled, caught himself and swung silently about at Dove. 
Gosh, Johnny, I'm sorry, snickered Dove. Sorry, huh? You're going to be a lot sorrier. I just didn't notice. You do that again and I'll beat you up again, you overgrown pig of a louse. You... He went on from there. Mr. Lapham was strict about his boys swearing, but Johnny could get along very well without. Whatever a pig of a louse was, it did describe the whitish, flaccid, parasitic dove. Little Dusty froze as the older boys quarreled. He knew Johnny could beat up Dove any time he chose. He worshipped Johnny and didn't like Dove, but he and Dove were bound together by their common servitude to Johnny's autocratic rule. Half of Dusty sympathized with one boy, half of him with the other, in this quarrel. It seemed to him that everybody liked Johnny. Old Mr. Lapham because he was so clever at his work. Mrs. Lapham because he was reliable. The four Lapham girls because he sassed them so, and then grinned. Most of the boys in the other shops around Hancock's Wharf liked Johnny, although some of them fought him on sight. Only Dove hated him. Sometimes he would get Dusty in a corner, tell him in a hoarse whisper how he was going to get a pair of scissors and cut out Johnny Tremaine's heart. But he never dared do more than trip him, and then whine out of it. Some day, said Johnny, his good nature restored, I'll kill you, Dove. In the meantime, you have your uses. You get out the buckets and run to North Square and fetch back drinking water. The Laphams were on the edge of the sea. Their well was brackish. Look here, Mrs. Lapham said Dusty was to go and get along with you. Don't you go arguing. For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now back to your host, Casey Trowbridge. We end our look at audiobooks for the 4th of July with a title from Random House Audio. It clocks in at only 48 minutes. It is narrated by Frank Langella and Boyd Gaines. But these 48 minutes are perhaps the most 48 minutes that we could possibly share with you on an episode like this. These 48 minutes of listening are to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States of America. All the other books that we've talked about today, be they historical or fiction, would not be possible without these two documents. And so that is why we are concluding with an excerpt from the Declaration of Independence and Constitution of the United States of America on audiobooks for the fourth of July. It's called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise. The state, remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within, he has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice, 
by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has effected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt us. We at the Talking Audiobooks podcast have highlighted a few books for you for audiobooks for the 4th of July, but this by no means even scratches the surface of all that has been written about this time period in American history. Next year, we may feature a whole new round of selections for audiobooks for the 4th of July, but that will have to wait until next year. For now, we hope you've enjoyed these selections that we have brought you. We would invite you to check out your favorite retailer of audiobooks for any or all of these titles. We would also invite you to send us feedback at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. Tell us your favorite audiobooks for the 4th of July 
Maybe they'll be featured on next year's theme episode covering this topic. For now, we hope you have a safe and happy 4th of July in the United States and all over the world. Even if you're not celebrating an Independence Day on July 4th, we hope you have a good week. And we hope you've enjoyed this look at a very special time in American history, courtesy of the Talking Audiobooks podcast. Until next time, keep listening. Audiobooks is a trademark of Kenjoy Media, produced by Kenjoy Media, copyright 2017, all rights reserved. Your host has been Casey Trowbridge, produced by Ken Joy, theme music composed by Christian Anderson, licensed through epidemicmusic.com. Visit our website at talkingaudiobooks.com, follow us on Twitter at Talking Audio, follow us on Facebook at Talking Audiobooks, and subscribe to the Talking Audiobooks YouTube channel. Here's a disclaimer. Various sponsors, like Audible.com, help make this podcast possible. However, they are not responsible for its content, they don't dictate what we talk about or what books we share with you, and therefore the opinions that you hear on here are unfortunately those of the host and our guests. We'd love to hear from you, so email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. Tell us what audiobooks you're listening to, what you've liked in the past, narrators that you like. Ask us questions, anything. It's for your feedback. Feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. That's it. See you next time on Talking Audiobooks.